There are some caveats to this. So there's some problem foods. So the catch to this is that um, uh, is that uh, uh, certain foods can uh, increase the amount of potassium being absorbed. This was a case a review of case reports uh, uh, causing hyperkalemia, and it was stratified by dietary intake, uh, and it was not restricted to those with chronic kidney disease. Uh, this very interesting paper. Uh, most of the case reports are attributed to juices, sauces, and dried food and not unprocessed plant foods. Uh, bananas tend to appear probably more often than would be expected given the spectrum of possible fruits and vegetables that are out there. And I think that's just due to recall bias as many people tend to associate bananas as being high in potassium, even though bananas are not one of the highest or high potassium containing foods when you look at uh, tables of uh, potassium content of foods. The reason juices and sauces and dried fruit are probably overrepresented in this is because they increase the amount of potassium being consumed per unit time. Um, a, a glass of orange juice, uh, for example, has a potassium content of two or three oranges. Um, and uh, you may have a couple of glasses of orange juice and you may get a substantial potassium load uh, from all the oranges that have been used to make that orange juice that was just consumed. And it's a similar idea with dried fruits. Uh, dried fruits are dehydrated. So dried figs and plums, for example, have a high potassium load. Uh, this is looking at it for per 100 grams. So if you dehydrate, take out the water content, instead of eating a plum or two, you could have 10 dried plums and then get a substantial load of potassium. So even though you're absorbing about 60 to 70% of that potassium, 60 to 70% of 10 dried plums worth of potassium is still a lot of potassium. So this is where dried fruits, sauces, and juices can become problematic. And for this reason, I recommend avoiding these things in those who have kidney problems. Uh, for the sake of time, we'll skip over this mortality issue. Um, and uh, uh, we'll jump to the end here. Um, <clears throat> There are some non-dietary causes of hyperkalemia that are very important to remember. Uh, so not if, if you have a high potassium level, it's not necessarily a function of uh, diet. There could be other things that, have be effect, that could be affecting it. Uh, several medical reasons that a doctor can look into. Uh, this includes uh, constipation, kidney disease, which we were talking about, exercise, medication side effects, uh, type 4 RTA, which, which we discussed. Uh, many medications are associated with high potassium levels uh, that have nothing to do with diet. Um, so that's important to, uh, to note. Uh, metabolic acidosis is a big contributor to high potassium level, especially in kidney disease. And it's important to treat that. And that can be done with fruits and vegetables. Um, so now at this point, we can just jump back to the original uh, PowerPoint. I just wanted to go do a deep dive with potassium. Uh, and let's, we can go back to the original PowerPoint and, uh, and wrap it up there. <clears throat> That's great, Dr. And so do you need a little extra hand from our tech team to just get back in or? I think I am there. You nailed it. <laughs> oh, Thank good. You. I, I am teachable. So we just went through all this so uh, a little bit more in depth. And uh, finally, to just mention, uh, uh, my colleagues and I wrote this paper, which uh, we spent years uh, thinking about it and finally came out this year. And it summarizes this literature. And um, uh, we're all actually really proud of this paper. A big, another big concern uh, to jump back to the original uh, table of contents in this PowerPoint presentation is uh, protein. Uh, I could do a deep dive into protein, uh, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, several studies have looked at uh, whether you can get enough protein uh, in kidney disease on a plant-based diet, and all of these studies have shown that indeed it is possible to do so. Uh, this Italian study showed that you can get 0.7 grams per kilogram per day. Uh, another Israeli study showed 0.75 grams per kilogram per day. This has even been shown in patients on dialysis who need a higher amount of protein intake because of uh, inflammation on dialysis, losses of protein during dialysis and decreases uh, in appetite and uh, various other things. Uh, so patients on dialysis are recommended to get one to 1 1.2 grams per kilogram per day. 
two studies that are uh, that looked into this show that folks were getting 1.2 to 1.25 grams or kilogram protein per day without a nutritional compromise. And of course, this can be modified to include more protein containing foods like beans and lentils to help attain even higher uh, protein targets. And a few years ago, we did summarize the literature on this. And uh, it is possible to get enough protein. You just have to eat a balanced diet. If you ate a diet that was exclusively based on apples and tomatoes or apples and pears, just something extremely restrictive and something that uh, the average person wouldn't do, uh, you could run into trouble, but most people don't do that. And in fact, if you have any sort of kidney disease and are wondering what to eat uh, with kidney disease, uh, uh, it's recommended to see a dietitian to avoid running into problems and just to be sure that you're doing the thing correctly. And also, of course, to talk about it with your doctor. Uh, we are towards the end. Uh, so I just wanted to mention uh, this topic, which is reversing kidney disease, which is everyone's favorite topic. Uh, there are, uh, I want to acknowledge that there are some uh, hypothetical uh uh, uh, not hypothetical. There are some um, hypothesis generating uh, pieces of evidence um, from case reports that show that uh, substantial improvement is bigger than what would be expected uh, just from diet alone. I put it out there just to show what does exist. It's not meant to say that you should uh, stop your treatment or stop seeing your doctor and abandon caution and uh, embrace whatever diet is prescribed but perhaps maybe to offer hope or to um, spark a conversation with your provider. Uh, one such example is this case series uh, in patients with lupus uh, and lupus kidney disease, which is uh, also known as lupus nephritis, which is very difficult to treat. In the two cases, uh, both had improvements in that GFR number, which is a percent kidney function. One went from 14 to 27, another one from 53 to 73. Uh, one of my favorite cases of uh, remission is uh, this gentleman named Dwayne Sunwald. Uh, Dwayne Sunwald and I have the pleasure of had the pleasure of speaking together at the National Kidney Foundation a few years ago, and we'll be speaking again uh, later this month at NEFCURE. Uh, he's a remarkable human being who uh, uh, is a chef, uh, was a former patient uh, of kidney disease. He was diagnosed with minimal change disease. And as you can see here in his own words, by replacing animal protein, plant-based protein, I was able to put CKD into remission. And this was published in a major medical journal uh, that was trying to give a voice to patients because as physicians, we don't often see this in the literature. We want to, uh, and in this uh, attempt to do so, uh, it was an opportunity to shine a light on Dwayne's case. Dwayne is actually no stranger to uh, publishing. He's published uh, a variety of times uh, about his own story. And the story is remarkable. He had severe kidney disease, tons of protein in his urine. Uh, he also had a creatinine of two. His EGFR was low and he was biopsied. And he did not have diabetes or high blood pressure. He had an autoimmune disease called minimal change disease. And uh, despite being immunosuppressed with steroids and uh, other chemotherapeutic agents, uh, his disease progressed, and ultimately he switched to a whole food plant-based diet, included some swimming. He lost 60 pounds. Uh, his kidney function improved almost uh, uh, almost uh, uh, immediately, and he regained his life. And he writes in this article that um, he appreciates the recommendations his doctor gave him to uh, increase the amount of plant-based foods he was eating. Uh, he thought his life had been gone forever. And now, uh, because of that, uh, he had been and continues to be able to keep up with professional work demands. Uh, he swims regularly, um, and uh, he gives talks on, his to on this topic uh, uh, with physicians like myself. So in the last few minutes here, I just want to offer a big picture and conclusion. Uh, so this is me going back to 2008, um, and with each passing year, 2008 looks... Uh, looks further and further as a distant memory. Uh, I had just started medical school at the University of Miami. Uh, I had no idea what kind of doctor I wanted to become. And normally when I give this talk, uh, uh, mentioning the Welcome to Miami song, uh, usually is not uh, uh, awkward, but in this situation, uh, given recent uh, experiences uh, or events, it's a little awkward. But at any rate, 
Um, I clearly did uh, did not know what would come uh, in the future of my life, but I was very interested in kidney transplant and kidneys. So I started to do a lot of research and because of the work and support of two important mentors pictured here, um, I was able to get involved in this area and do research and contribute to this uh, area. The big issue uh, in kidney disease is, you know, um, many folks have progression of the kidney disease and ultimately need a transplant. And if you go back to at that time, the supply and demand of kidney, uh, kidneys was uh, very uh, mismatched. Uh, the demand for kidneys, uh, as listed in the orange, outstripped by several fold the supply for kidneys provided in the blue there. And it just continues to get worse. Um, it's gotten slightly better in recent years, but as you can see overall, demand for kidneys exceeds supply. And uh, this is just a brief glimpse into some of the work that I was uh, privileged to be a part of uh, with that team down there. Just looking into some of these issues and trying to address some things um, but ultimately, uh, I decided to do research after med school to uh, work on some projects looking into artificial kidneys. And uh, ultimately, I did go to residency and uh, fellowship and become a doctor. But during that, that year, that pivotal year, I learned some things. And one of the things was that making an artificial kidney is incredibly hard and if not impossible because of just all the technological requirements that are needed. And even though we're now living in 2022, um, and science has progressed a lot. Uh, there's just some things that are very difficult to overcome, uh, like keeping cells alive in a bioreactor for an extended period of time and clotting and things like this that continue to plague the progress of artificial kidneys. At any rate, but what I did learn, and as well we talked about at the very beginning, is that the causes of kidney failure, the number one, number two causes are diabetes and high blood pressure. And, and then the light bulb kind of went off. Type 2 and diabetes, type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure need not happen. Type 2 diabetes and hypertension need not be uncontrolled, and they certainly need not cause kidney failure. And when you look at it closer, 90% of all diabetes is type 2. I understand that type 1 diabetes is autoimmune, but we're talking about type 2 diabetes. And 90% of diabetes, of all diabetes, is type 2, and 90% of type 2 is preventable and 80% of high blood pressure is preventable. So we're looking at very big percentages of the two most common causes of kidney disease. And this reminds me of the saying of the first uh, human heart transplant surgeon, Christian Barnard, uh, who was in South Africa. He says that I have saved the lives of 150 people by heart transplants. If I had focused on preventative medicine earlier, I might have saved 150 million. And that's just so, uh, important and right and, um, and uh, very true. And a lot of my work kind of goes to that. The idea is just to move people along the spectrum. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, I've been very privileged to work here at Bellevue Hospital um, in our plant-based lifestyle medicine program, which helps patients uh, eat healthier, exercise more, reduce stress, and live a healthier life. Uh, in the hopes of preventing complications of diseases. So in summary, uh, the role of plant-based diets in kidney disease can prevent the causes of kidney disease like diabetes, hypertension, obesity. If you already have these diseases, it can help prevent the progression. It can help control them. Not everyone has a, a miraculous cure, but most people have some improvement, certainly. It can also help reduce the complications of kidney disease high phosphate levels, acid levels, uh, blood pressure that comes from a kidney disease, uh, uremic toxins, which we didn't talk about too much in this talk, and then of course the dreaded mortality issue. And then it can also attenuate the progression of kidney disease, um, like the decline in that all important EGFR number and the amount of protein in urine. Um, and of course, all this comes from a recent paper that was on it. And uh, the work of myself and several of my colleagues has led to a reconsideration of what is a renal diet. And we're moving towards adopting this, this diet called the Plato diet, uh, which stands for a plant dominant low protein diet for kidney disease. And this may be what the future renal diet looks like. Uh, it represents avoiding too much protein to avoid taxing the kidneys, as I mentioned earlier. It emphasizes plant sources for protein. 
And uh, it also restricts sodium, emphasizes fiber, and it's hope it's it's hoped that by doing so, this will prevent kidney disease, uh, pre uh, prevent the progression, prevent kidney failure and dialysis, improve cardiovascular health and survival, and uh, and overall improve things that are important to patients like quality of life and dietary palatability and adherence. Mm -hmm.